Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sermon Notes. This week, we're looking at Matthew chapter 18. We're looking specifically at verses 5 to 14. On Sunday, we were looking at verses 1 to 4, and the topic that we were looking at in those verses is, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Do you remember Matthew 18, verses 1 to 4, that Jesus gives an object lesson? He puts a child in front of them and says, if anyone is to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, they must become like a child. Well, now in verses 5 to 14, we see a shift take place from the topic of who is the greatest. But there's still a connection to this object lesson. The connection to the object lesson is that many will come to know and love Jesus Christ by humbling themselves as a child. And then coming into the kingdom, they are now part of the church. And so the shift that takes place from verse 4 to 5 is quite significant. The topic is going to change, which made it very difficult for me to be able to get into that in the sermon on Sunday. But if we look at the topic change as something that's still connected with what it means to enter into the kingdom of heaven, is to humble that oneself and to become a disciple, well, now we can see that in Matthew 18, verses 5 to 14, we see that the shift is expanding on this object lesson. The expanding that's taking place is now going to talk about those who have come into the kingdom, are now disciples, and they are precious. They are precious to God, they are precious to Jesus, and that will be the focus now of verses 5 to 14. Well, before we dig into verses 5 to 14, I first of all want us to see a new lens that Jesus is giving us to view things through and an issue, an issue that's going on in chapter 18. Through that lens, we can see what Jesus is talking about. Well, what is that lens? The lens is the church. This is first brought up in Matthew 16. It's the first time that Jesus talks about the church in Matthew's gospel. It's Matthew 16, and he talks about this when he is saying that he will build his church upon his disciples, through his disciples, his church will be built. And he talks about Peter being a rock that he will use as a leader among these disciples who are rocks that Jesus will build his church upon. So the focus of this lens is the church and disciples. And now here in chapter 18, the issue comes out to view things through a church lens is to view disciples as being precious. And in fact, the issue being that if you mistreat disciples, then you are in fact mistreating Jesus himself. And if you are treating those disciples as precious, you are treating Jesus himself as being precious. Now let's look now at the verses themselves. Now as we look at verse 5, which begins, and anyone who welcomes a little child like this, we can see through the lens of the church that these little children, or little child, is in fact, through the lens of the church, disciples of Jesus. And so that shift that takes place right here at verse 5 is now going to focus on the church and to focus specifically on these disciples. Little ones who have humbled themselves to believe and receive and now are disciples in the church and must be treated as precious. Now, we've been looking at verse 5, which continues to say, anyone who welcomes a little child like this, a disciple of Jesus, on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, well, that is the shift, isn't it? Between the positive side of Welcoming a disciple that's on a mission to serve Jesus is to welcome Jesus himself, but to cause one to stumble is a very serious offense. We will see how serious now as we look at verse 6. In verses 6 to 10, Jesus gives warnings about causing one of these disciples to fall into sin or to stumble or to even fall away from believing in him. Verse 6 says this, 
But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, and now he gives some warnings about just how severe this is. It reminds me of warning signs along a path. And as you go along the path, you see that these warning signs are telling you to turn around. Don't go there. That's the wrong way to live. Well, it reminds me of a time when I was a child. We went to uh, California with my parents and we were in Palm Springs and my dad said, I've got a great idea for what we're gonna do today. We're going to go and meet Bob Hope. Yeah, he had found somehow out where Bob Hope lived. He lived on a, in a huge house on the top of a hill there in Palm Springs and he said, let's go meet Bob Hope. So we jumped in the car and we started up this laneway that led up to his huge house on the bluff. And as we started up the hill, we saw the first warning sign. That sign said that this is private property. No problem, said my dad. We're gonna keep going on because that sign doesn't apply to us. My mother was not impressed, but we kept going up. We got to the second sign and that sign said, trespassers will be prosecuted. No problem again, said my dad. We're not trespassings. We're going to be friends of Bob Hope's. And that's when we came across the third sign. The third sign simply said this, trespassers will be shot. Well, my mother had had enough and the brakes went on. The car turned around and we headed back down the hill. Those warning signs along the path remind me of what's going on here in verses 6 to 10, where the warnings are given about what it means to cause a disciple who's following Jesus to stumble, to fall into sin, and to fall away from believing in him. And if you'd like, the severity of that third sign that we saw on our way up to Bob Hope's house, that's what's going on here in the second half of verse 6, that kind of severe warning. Let's look at the verse together again. Verse 6 says, But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, here's how severe it is. It would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and to be drowned into the depths of the sea. Wow. That is severe to think about a millstone, this large, heavy stone that was used to be turned around and around and around in order to grind up flour, to grind up wheat into flour. These large, heavy millstones that have been used for centuries and centuries and are still used even to this day are extremely heavy. And so we get the severity of this warning being that it would be uh, like, uh, it would be better for you if you had instant death rather than to cause a precious one to stumble. For that's what would happen if a millstone was tied around your neck and you were dropped into the depths of the sea. You would go right down and drowning would happen. So better a quick end, like a millstone around the neck, than to be guilty of causing a disciple to stumble and Jesus continues now in verse 7 to say that this warning is so serious, it's a warning to the whole world. What sorrow awaits the world, verse 7, because it tempts people to sin. Temptations are inevitable, but sorrow, what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? Now the warning signs that Jesus gives are connected specifically to parts of the body that might be used to do the tempting to be caused, to be used rather, to cause somebody to stumble. And these warnings that are given in verse eight are hyperbole. They're warnings that are great exaggerations in order to get across the severity of the point. The hyperboles that are used then are encouraging people to take serious what Jesus is warning. Verse eight, so if your hand or foot causes you to sin. Cut it off and throw it away. There's the hyperbole. It's better, he says, to enter into eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. Jesus has in mind here a focus 
and that focus is the end times, the times when Jesus will judge everyone and there will be a sorting out of those who have believed in Jesus and those who have not. For those who believe in Jesus, they are given, here in verse 8, life, and that life is eternal. The word that Jesus uses here for life is zoe, a Greek word meaning that fullest sense of life, life that can only be full if it is a life that is filled with the presence of God. That's life to the full. Whereas the opposite of this is eternal fire. So it is fire that is eternal. And this is the word pyre. And the word pyre is that sense of complete loss, utter lostness, having no connection with God, and therefore no sense of that fullness of what it means to live in him. Well, these two things here mentioned in verse 8, these two words that are used, are referring to what's to come in the time of judgment at the end. Verse 9 says, and if you cause someone to sin by using your eyes, probably having to do with the lust of the flesh, well, then it would be better for you to gouge that out and throw it away. Now, this brings up a question. Does this mean that when we get to glory, uh, we are going to have a body that could be missing a hand? We could be missing a foot or an eye? What's going on here? Remember, when we're looking at this as a hyperbole that's meant to get across the severity of the point that's being made, we can see that this is not a theology of resurrection bodies that Jesus is talking about. No, he's talking about the severity of tempting somebody to sin. So it's sinful. You would be sinning in, if you were to use hand and feet and eyes, uh, perhaps referring to things like the lust of the flesh, action, moving towards, having somebody move towards sin with their feet, putting their hands to something that is sinful. That in and of itself, to tempt a disciple to do that is sinful. So, it's so severe that it would be better for you to gouge your eye out than to sin like that. And this, again, refers to the end times of judgment where it would be better for you to have no eye than to go into eternal life, Zoe life, the fullness of God, where the veil is lifted. Now I see, uh, but in a mirror dimly, but then shall, shall I see fully, in that time of seeing fully the fullness of God, well, that is this eternal life that awaits those who are disciples of Jesus. Better to go into heaven with this sense of uh, following the, the fullness of God than to have yourself thrown into the pyre, the fire of hell. Verse 10 continues another warning sign to the church, looking through the lens of the church. Verse 10, Jesus says, Beware that you don't look down on any of these disciples, on any of these little ones. That phrase, look down, is the same phrase that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, when he says to Timothy, Don't let anyone look down on you for your youth. This warning here in Matthew 18 is for the church to say, beware that you don't look down on any of his disciples. This isn't something that the church has done well, have we? Uh, we have been, the church at large, has been guilty of looking down on one another. And when we do that, perhaps looking down our nose at the way somebody else is dressed or acts or speaks or lives, uh, perhaps we are treating somebody uh, inappropriately because of their youth, or perhaps it's much more serious than even this, Jesus wants to emphasize that what you are doing as you look down upon, uh, look down negatively upon one of his disciples is that this is severe because of just how precious these disciples of his are. Just what is their value? Well, that is picked up again here in the second half of verse 10, 
when Jesus talks about angels of these disciples. Let me erase this and we'll talk about the angels of these disciples. How precious are these disciples of Jesus? They have angels that are caring for them. This is implied in this phrase, for I tell you that in heaven they're angels. It seems that what Jesus is referring to are angels that are in heaven, and these angels are actually connected to, perhaps in a caring way, perhaps in an interceding way, perhaps in a protecting way. We don't know for sure all the details from this passage around what these angels are actually doing, but we do know that they are connected to the disciples. They are the disciples' angels. Therefore, there is incredible value to these disciples because they have angels that are caring for them, that are interceding for them, that are protecting them. These angels then make an incredible amount of value for the disciple themselves. But not only that, Jesus raises this value even further when he says that these angels are always in the presence of the Heavenly Father. That's extraordinary. To be in the presence and the glory of the Heavenly Father always gives an unbelievable amount of value to those angels themselves. And to think, think for a moment, church, that those angels that have this constant presence of the Father around them, with them, that they are constantly in the presence of the Father, that those angels are in some way connected to us in the plans of God, perhaps, as I say, to comfort, to care, perhaps to intercede for, perhaps even to protect from the enemy and to protect from circumstances in our world. I'm falling short of saying that these are guardian angels. That's something that we've created ourselves. But what we do see from Matthew 18 is that there is a connection here for the purpose of, remember, Jesus giving such value, describing just how precious disciples are to him, his concern that none of his disciples are lost or should perish. I believe that's what's going on in verse 10. And now verses 12 to 14, these verses are a parable that I think wrap up beautifully what's going on in verses 5 to verse 10. And this parable of the lost sheep. The story gives a great visual, doesn't it, of what Jesus has been talking about. The story is not about the 99 who are left behind. The story is specifically about how precious the one is that's lost and that Jesus is likely uh, the one in this story that would leave the 99 in order to go and to seek out the one that is lost and then what great rejoicing it would be to find the one that is lost. This sheep that is lost then in the parable of the lost sheep is likely, as it's connected to the rest of the passage, referring to a disciple that has stumbled, that has fallen, that has uh, perhaps stopped believing in Jesus himself, and that this one is so precious and valuable to God that he would go and he would search for and he would actively seek to find that one. Well, this uh, final passage then as an illustration brings together the full measure of what's going on in verses 1 to 14. Yes, Jesus, he is the great one. Then for anyone to humble themselves like Jesus, the great one, and to, as a child is, humble oneself to become a believer in Jesus, you are part of the church. You are a disciple. You are a little one like this child that is now a humble follower of Jesus. It is good to welcome those little ones in who are on mission to serve God is to serve Jesus himself. But to cause one of these little ones to stumble is so severe because of the great value that God places upon his disciples. Therefore, these hyperboles, which are so extraordinary, 
make it just so effective for us to make this a priority in our life, to make this part of our life, and that is to not look down on anyone who is a believer in Jesus and to certainly not cause one of those ones to stumble or to fall. I hope that this uh, sermon notes this week has been an encouragement to you as you think about what it means to move forward in our day as the church. Mm -hmm.